Court is now in session. Is there anyone here who needs to come and stand before me and be judged this morning? I told you I was going to wear a ponytail one day. <laughs> Many of us in this room have been in a courtroom and we've watched judging happen. And unfortunately, we now develop the habit in the church where we come and we say we're Christians and we run around and we judge everybody. That is not of God. So I know anyone in this room and people watching by live stream, I don't want anyone to have to think they got to be judged to come to this church. Let me tell you, you do not. You are welcome in this church because God welcomes you. Because his son Jesus died on the cross so that you could have eternal life. And so today I, I, I want you to understand what I'm getting ready to preach. I've wanted to preach for like two years and the Lord wouldn't let me do that. Have you ever wondered what's under a judge's robe? So, I just want you to see me shake. It says what? Let me come over here. What does it say? Sandy, come read this. Come stand up here with me and tell these people what that says. Because there's old people back in the back that ain't got no idea. It says, be careful or you'll end up in my sermon. <laughs> so... Today, I have to take my headpiece off because Sandy won't take me serious if I don't. Lord, I hope this don't mess up my hair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it is important to look good. Man, you're a pretty dude. So what I want to do this morning is I want to inspire you to break a habit that has been created in our lives. We have watched it in the media. We have watched it in the school. We've watched it in the job field. And we've seen it in the church. And in the church, it's ugly. And so I'm going to pull my heart out to you. I love you. But it's time for us to quit judging people. The Bible tells us, very simple, that you and I take your Bibles, and I hope you'll continue to start bringing your Bibles where you can pull it up. It's in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, if you got your Bibles, I want you to open up to the very first five verses of chapter 7, and you should know that this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has preached this butt-kicking sermon and has begun to teach us Something, and I want us to read this. Watch this. This is the word of God and is without error. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. For you will treat, you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And worry if don't, and why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think about saying to your friends, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eyes when you cannot even get past the log in yours? Hypocrite. The translation from the Greek says, the person who thinks like this is a hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your eye and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eyes. What, what does all this mean? All the confusion that we hear about judging, and there's so much misunderstanding about judging. How often do we jump to conclusions and make judgmental statements only to find out later how far off base we were? Then we wish we could cut our tongue out and wish we hadn't said nothing. So I want to do a survey. How many of you in here have ever said something that you wish you had not said? Okay, I want you to hold both two hands up. 
what happened? We're all this way. And this is why I'm preaching this, because Jesus is teaching us to not to be this way. This whole idea about judging. So i got to share with you something. If I am going to judge somebody, hear me out, listen to me. If you're going to judge somebody, the only person qualified to do that is God. And I'm not qualified to judge as God would judge. I'm just not qualified for that. So when I begin to look, I started thinking, why do we judge? Why do we, why do we just jump to conclusions? So what I've learned is we don't know all the facts. When we meet somebody and deal with somebody, we do not know all the facts. We're unable to read the motives, and we don't know what their motivation is and why they do that. We find it impossible to be totally objective because we don't know all the facts. We lack the big picture. We, we, we live in blind spots in our lives. We are prejudiced and have blurred perception of everything. Most of ourselves, we ourselves are imperfect and inconsistent people. But we continue to judge people as though we're not. We, there is no, there's a tremendous amount of power in what Jesus said here. He gives us incredible promises. He shows us a dynamic change in our life and our relationship. People who hold on to these things that Jesus has taught us have great relationships with their family and their friends and all this and in their marriages. When you get a hold of Jesus, it brings joy to your church life, and it brings family. I, I, I tell you, when you walk, when we saw all the stuff that was going on just yesterday, that's not, let me tell you something. We got stuff going on here every single day. People cutting grass, people cleaning bathrooms, people helping us move this and do this, painting that and doing that. And it gives us incredible relationship when we don't judge people. I don't know about you. But Jesus teaches us if we'll quit this silly judging, our personalities will change because we will see the positive in people and not the negative. We enjoy being around people who are encouraging. I do not, I tell you to your face, I do not like to be around people who are negative. Y'all drive me nuts. Because what happens is I see all the things that God is trying to do in my own life and often in our church life. I'm doing this like yesterday. I, I have to bring up my little buddy, Hank. Hank is Ron Faircloth and Ann's dog. I love this dog. When Ron comes in, I don't say hello to Ron. My first question to Ron, where's Hank? He's out in the car. What? Bring the dog in before you come in, Ron. And what happens, you watch all these people. And you see all the people. It was our young people. It was... All ages, young people to old people. I don't know what old is anymore. I don't talk about it anymore. Everybody working together, and no one was judging anybody. Now, we had a lot of supervisors out there yesterday. You all see some pictures I've got where people's arm is on their shovel looking at other people. Why aren't you doing that? And it was funny because Mark and I came back in. We took a break, and, and some folks had brought us food yesterday. I want to tell you, the people that were in here working on this floor and stuff, they didn't lose no weight. We ate all the time. Mark said, we come back after lunch, Mark said, well, the, Saturday morning when Mark came in, he said, well, I reckon the gremlins didn't come in and finish this floor. No, it takes people to do that. And what I'm trying to teach you this morning is that we cannot be judging people just because of the fact of something that happens. You know what? I, let me tell you what I've learned and what I'm going to preach about this morning. See, it really comes down and judging comes down to three positions. And they're all scripture. Hypocrisy. Integrity. And mercy. These three fit together. And what they do is they show us not how to be. Don't judge. Listen to me. Don't judge. It is said by people who don't like it when we dare to have a Christian worldview. They'll tell me. In fact, I have found that most narrow-minded people I come upon, for those who claim to be most broad-minded, are the least to accept other people. Because when a Christian has an opinion, and a non-believer will say, how dare you say that? 
you're judging me. You need to understand if the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you to say something to somebody, you will do it in love and the right attitude and have the right heart. No one in here needs to judge anybody. So I'm going to do a survey. I'm on survey kick the morning, so you just keep your hands ready. How many of you in this room, sitting within in this room and all life, how many of you in here have no sin in your life? I want to make sure I only have one eye, so I got to take my time and look at it. We all have sin. I guarantee if you came up at 77 this morning to come to our church, you sin because there was somebody cut you off. If you come from the other side of Fort Mill, somebody cut you off. If you stopped at the store this morning at Bojangles to get you a biscuit, you probably got mad because it took too long. Jesus, listen, this is what you get with me this morning. What did Jesus say? Here's what we learned. Hypocrisy means looking at others' junk, forgetting our junk. I got some junk in my trunk, and you got junk in yours. You got junk in your closet, and we all have them. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, you are hypocrites. You wash the outside of your cups and dishes, but inside is full of you by cheating others, and pleasing yourselves. Hypocrisy is being more concerned about the appearance of something than the reality of it. Hypocrisy is putting requirements and burdens on others that we ourselves are not willing to live up to. We go through this all the time. We, we find ourselves in a situation where we judge people, but we don't even hold the same standard. I, I, I say this to you in a loving way. I've seen people that think they're so holy, they're here, and this is the rules they want you to go by, and this is the rules they go by. That's why the Bible teaches this. This is exactly why Jesus inspired the words that he said, because we have double standards on how we do things. For example, let me just say this to you this morning. It would be, it would be like going to an AA meeting. Many of you know what an AA meeting is. It would be like going to an AA meeting in a bar. Or it, it would be a hypocrisy if you were having a Weight Watchers meeting and you went to the Pete's place and the ice cream place and my favorite ice cream place is a DQ right up the street. It's, hypocrisy is like having um, people who have no hair. And there's some of y'all in here, I won't mention it right now. But some of you have no hair and you have a meeting in a hairstyle place. And then why is hypocrisy? It's the kind of hypocrisy in life where we lie to ourselves. Matter of fact, we put on a mask. That's kind of the reason I wore this. We put on mask in our life. And what that mask means is that we're trying to hide the real you, the real me. And when we put on masks, we seem to be holier than thou. And in fact, we're not. I love every person in this room. I love every person that's watching my live stream. I'm just asking you, please take off the mask and be you. See, for us, I've been trained as a person growing up. Me and Mike Blackman talk about this some. And we, we both grew up in church. Every time the doors were open, mom and daddy went, and we went and did and did and did and did. And, and we saw all the good and bad and the ugly of the church. But we keep going to church because Jesus is there and he wants to meet you there. When you start looking at things, we begin to realize that God wants to set you free this morning. If you're here this morning and you're negative and you will, all you want to do is judge people, Jesus wants to set you free this morning. See, look, he loves everybody. He loves you this morning, warts and all. And Jesus reminds us, watch out for hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is, means putting on that mask. And so I don't want you to be a hypocrite this morning. I want you to be a person who absolutely is sold out to Jesus Christ. If you're sold out to Jesus Christ this morning and you want to do what Jesus has said, then don't judge. The second part of this sermon is this. He wants us if, to be people that have integrity. Integrity is taking a long look at yourself and doing something about it. So I want you to close your eyes for a second. I want you to close your eyes. If you don't, I'll make you come to the room and stand with me the rest of the service. 
close your eyes just for a second. I want to ask you one question. What is the one thing that's holding you back from being what you've been called by God to do? What's the one thing? One thing that's holding you back from being what God has called you to be. So integrity, open your eyes, look at it and see how pretty I am. And what we see is what it says in 1 Chronicles 29 17. It says, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. God wants us to be people of integrity. Integrity is removing the junk, the sin in our life. He wants us to move it out. It's easier to notice people's problems in other people more than it is for us to look. He tells us this. He says, listen, that's why the person in your office who you are more irritated with because of their little habits, they're the ones most likely in your office would come to church if you would just invite them. They are a lot like you, but you get irritated by them, and what you notice is, is that they are just like you. Parents, this is one of the reasons why one child that you had the most bugs about or the most problems with is because they do things that they do, it drives you nuts. And the way it handles it is that one child is most likely going to be just like you. Now, I don't know about you, but so let me do a survey. How many of you in here would admit you were, if you were looking at your life and you were looking at your parents, you would say you're like your mom? Raise your hand. Okay, all right, put your hand. All right, the other side is, uh, in here, how many of you were like your dad? Would you raise your hand? Okay, the rest of you must be aliens then. So, so what happens, we're all like this. And, and, and what God wants us to do, you and I need to choose to focus on our problems instead of other people's problems. But, so let me show you something. Let's do this. I want you to look to your left and right. If someone does not have green on, I want you to reach over and pinch them right quick. Larry Pink's Chuck. All right. Let me teach you something. I'm just doing a, I'm doing a pause here on my sermon. Let me teach you. When you see the shamrock, I'm 22% Irish. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, got, I'm so mixed up that they just call me sooner. Sooner be this, sooner be that. When you read, when you see a shamrock, it's, it's, not so much. We, we don't even know what it is. When St. Patrick, the shamrock represents the Trinity. That's what the shamrock does. Oh, I know we, well, all the things we do during Irish Day. Maybe they won't do all those things today as much. But the point of it is you need to see that these things happen. So when we talk about St. Patrick's Day, there's some folks in here who's got a birthday that's on St. Patrick's Day. And there's other folks having birthdays this week. But St. Patrick's Day itself is a really a religious holiday. It's not what it's become. And so I say to you today is that when you look at the shamrock today, now you know what the, what the shamrock means. So I want to go back to say about integrity. Life is a test. And one of the main questions you must face in this quiz is, am I, do I have integrity? Do I do what I say? Do I act the way I should act? And nobody in this room is perfect. I just want you to be you. There's two choices that you can have when dealing with integrity. One is this. You can either gossip about somebody or you can grow in your life when you see people. I can grasp intensely, mentally, externally, and we can run people down and wear them out. But the key with integrity is you're not looking at everybody else's problems. You're looking at your own life problems. I need to grow in my life. I'm the pastor of the church. I need to grow just like you need to grow. And I need to do it right. And when I see situations, I want you to understand that integrity comes by not looking at the individual's problems, but trying to look for the solution. And let me say this to you this morning. If you're dealing with somebody and they got all kind of problems, don't you be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't need your help. Let the Holy Spirit do his job. And when we criticize people and we get down on their case and because they don't do it the way we want them to do it, I want to say this to you this morning. When people don't meet to your standards, your standards are wrong. I want to give you one example. Maybe you're a person in the church 
who has got somebody who's not living to your standard, I want to say to you this morning, if everybody in this church, hear me out and hear me clear, if we removed every person in this church who has sin in their life, there would be nobody working with your children. You wouldn't have people in that nursery this morning. I would have not had 65 people here at this church this weekend working. That would have never happened. And so I give you a piece of scripture that you need to remember in a moment in time. For us who love Chosen, this really became very apparent to us when we watched the Chosen piece where Judas comes on the scene. Judas comes on the scene. Let me remind you who Jesus is. He is God. He knew exactly what Judas was going to do. This is where you say amen. But what did Jesus do with Judas? Jesus knows all things, right? Nod your head this way. So you think you're hiding from Jesus? You ain't. Jesus knew what Judas would do. What did Jesus do when Judas comes on the scene? It, it, we, we know it's about the time of the Sermon on the Mount, which I'm preaching out of this morning. What did Jesus do? He didn't go look at Peter. Come up here. Come, big man. Come up here. Come up the steps because you're old. Come on up the steps. James is playing Judas. What happens? Be Jesus. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you're close. <laughs> it would be like when Judas comes on the scene that he looks at Judas. God, Jesus already knows what's going to happen in this story. And he looks at him and says, Judas, get out of here. We don't want your kind. But what does Jesus do with Judas? He puts his arm around him and loves him, don't he? All right, give James a big hand. Come on. I'm on a roll this morning. You might get out of here at 1 o'clock today. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to tell you. This is why we have so much confusion in judgment. Is because we think that we know everything. You don't. But Jesus takes Judas. Why? Because he loves Judas. And he loves you. He loves that person in your office that you despise. He loves that person that your children go to school with, that teacher that you can't stand. He loves the umpire, Steve. He loves that umpire, his coach calling balls and strikes, even if Steve can't see. But he loves them. And I, I begin to realize this. My heart is so full. See, in integrity, you don't blame others for your faults. You blame you. We, we begin to realize that we need to, these things are to be tested every day in our life. So I tell you about integrity this morning. It means that you make up your mind in advance. You don't wait till a situation comes to decide what you, is truth and what's not true. What you do is you, you begin to realize is that we begin to, in advance, we begin to plan. The most important decision of your life will have you've got to do is decide to look in advance of what you will do when the situation comes. When you go to get married and you stand before the preacher, that is not the time to decide whether you're going to marry her or not. You better than had your mind made up in advance. There could be a killing on the scene. And you have to decide. Integrity teaches us that when we were with people, and we may know a little bit about them, is that we don't make our mind up. My friends, Jesus loves all people. My friend John and Bonnie Russell had just got back from Egypt. I, they didn't have a suitcase big enough for me to go with them. And I guarantee if you talk to them, they met all kinds of people from all over the world, and, and most of them probably didn't act like them. Most of them didn't look like them. But I know John and Bonnie Rudisel, and I know that they love all people, and they want all people to be saved, and they want none to perish. What he's telling us is have the integrity. There's not a person in this room that I don't love this morning. I have, a, have friends that 
come here. I have people who where I live are here. And I'm just so excited because people just keep coming. And we keep doing and we keep reaching the gospel. So when we walk out of here today, I'm teaching you, quit judging, have integrity. Trust the Holy Spirit. And then the third part about this judgment thing is very simple. Mercy is helping others deal with their life problem with the goal of making them strong. Matthew 5, 7, it says it this way. As Matthew wrote it, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, blessed are the merciful, for they will show mercy. Mercy is not pretending that someone does not have sin in their life. No, it's not. It's helping them to become overcomers of the sin that they're dealing with. Once you take the log out of your own eye, you will be able to see who's in the room. You'll be able to see the people around you. He just tells us, very simple, get the speck out of your own eye before you start jumping on everybody else. He says, take care of you. Now, I want you to understand that a lot of people think being not non-judgmental means you can't even say or anything about a struggle or any situation. That's not judgmental. That's ridiculous. What I'm trying to teach you is if you see something wrong, what do you do about it? A politician is doing something wrong. He's in your district. What do you do about it? You call him. He ain't going to answer it. You're wasting your time calling him or her. You send him an email as a Christian. You don't write the email and blister them. As a Christian, you should be saying, I've been praying about this. And I want you to know that as I pray, this is what the Lord is telling me. And maybe, hopefully, you can find a verse. And that you say, I'm going to be praying that you will change your mind. I promise you this. You'll get more changes if you do it that way. And then you blister them. I just say to you as your pastor, you send me a blistering email, probably won't read after the first line. It's not the right way. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's not the right way. So I ask you again, is there anyone in here without sin? Then cast the first stone. And judging means that we see a situation and we do things. Bill, Grant, and I email each other about stuff we see and read, and all we can do is pray and encourage people that are in that situation. We're not judgmental. We can't be judgmental. All of God's people, right? Okay, on three, we're all going to say amen. Amen. Y'all have got to catch it because people are people. We can be the greatest witness. The reason we're not winning people is we're judging instead of praying and encouraging to come to know Jesus Christ. You want to know why we're not winning anybody? No one's going to listen to you if all you do is judge, judge, judge. I'm just saying to you this morning, it means on mercy, it means that we admit that we all face temptation. I guarantee you, if you were here yesterday in our church, you would have found temptation when somebody hit their thumb with a hammer or somebody got their finger pinched trying to put in flooring or if you watched Charlie cut wood. I mean, there's temptation. Charlie, what is wrong with you? You can't see. Get some glasses on. But what happened to us is that we all worked together and we didn't do that. It means that you realize that nobody is outside the circle of God's grace. When we give mercy, no one's outside. Everybody has this idea that we're outside. No, we're not. I need grace and you need grace. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and I'll tell him, go tell him right now and turn to your neighbor. I'm giving you grace. Go ahead. I've just learned that in this mercy is saying first that I need to take care of my life, then I have mercy to offer to those who need mercy. What does it look like when we become merciful people? What, do we, what does it look like? It looks like when we change our attitude. We, we begin to see people for who they really are, not something they're not. It, it, it changes when you have mercy. It changes that you become approachable. That means that you can do stuff. That also means that you can be gentle. That we don't get fired up every time something doesn't go our way. So I want you to start today. I want to teach you something. I want you to listen to me. 
I want to teach. I want you to apply what I'm teaching to you today. It is God's word. I've given you scripture. This scripture that I gave you is early, early in Jesus' ministry. So how can I overcome this judging thing? I'm glad you asked. First, reject, reject, reject hypocrisy. If you want to reject hypocrisy, quit pretending that you're something that you're not. Romans 12, 9, Paul writes, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight to what is good. If you want to reject hypocrisy in another person, you got to change your heart. It is written in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the old people who look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks inside the heart. We got to look at people's heart. We don't know. So we got to reject, reject, reject hypocrisy. And then we got to choose integrity. Paul writes later in Ephesians 4 15, speaking the truth in the spirit of love. You have to speak truth, and it has to be in the spirit of love, or it's not going to do anything except be rejected. When we fuss at people and we sum them up, they have no idea. This morning I came in, I wonder how much being gay was going to be on all the people that were here working all weekend long. I don't reject Mike Fitzpatrick because he smells like being gay this morning. I love him. And the point I'm trying to tell us is that we have to be people that choose, that choose to be integrity. Integrity is key for us to be Christians. Integrity is asking God for help. God, help me to love this person. Help me to pray over this person. Help me to be a witness to this person. David says in Psalms 101, verse 2, I will try to walk a blameless path, but how I need your help, especially in my own hometown. For us to walk, we have to ask God's help. And don't forget who's giving you the help. It's not you. And then, if you want to change this judging stuff, show mercy to somebody this week. I, we, we give you cards in your chair. And we've asked you to take that card and invite someone. Give that person a card who's not in church. Give them that card and invite them. And the reason we asked you to do that is because Jesus says he wants none to perish. That is showing mercy. You know how Jesus showed mercy? He went to the cross at Calvary and died on the cross for our sins. And he committed none. That's real mercy. God has chosen you and made you his holy people. He loves you. So you should always clothe yourself with mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So I have to tell you a story. So we were, I'm, I've been kind of, I don't even know how to say this. I think I'm a project manager is what this was. So we were trying, I had all these people helping me. I, I, listen, listen, the reason I'm a preacher, because I can't do nothing else. They hand me a hammer, which end I use here? Johnny, I don't know. So what happens is we are organizing and lots of people behind the scenes uh, trying to help us. And so we're getting down to the nitty gritty. We ordered the floor. Do you remember? Y'all pay for the floor. $25,000 was paid for the floor. And it is paid for. We go, we order it. It's up in Charlotte. What's the name of that? Floor decor. And tambourines or something like that and so we i go up we give them a check and it was a hassle with the check but we got it and got to know the lady there's a little lady named leslie and there's a, an assistant manager named gary and we get it all worked out we get it all ordered i said now i gotta have it on what day march 13th so your preachers may look a little dumb but he ain't dumb because i knew the 14th was thursday and the 15th was what work day so I tried to call him on Wednesday after I got my hair cut. Every Wednesday, same time, same station. And I called five times. I waited online for five minutes each time. Now, I don't know if you know me, but here's what happens. On that fourth and fifth time, I hung up and took off up there. I don't like phones anyway. I get up there, I walk in, and I, I want to be mad, you know? just wanted to be mad and there was miss leslie 
Here's the words that she said. Hey, Pastor Barry, how are you doing? <laughs> how could I be mad at her? She just said, hey, Pastor Barry. She said, well, how are you doing? I said, well, I was coming to check on our order. And, and maybe is Daniel here? And she said, no, he's off today. I figured that. It's Wednesday. This is the day I come. He's off. Maybe he was praying. I don't know. So I said, well, is Gary here? And she said, yeah, let me get him. And so she calls him over the intercom. This is what she said. Hey, Gary, uh, Pastor Barry is up here checking on his flooring. Now everybody in the store knows. <laughs> and then Gary comes walking up. Nice, just nice guy. I've invited him to come Easter. Hope he does. He walks up and he says, hey, Pastor Barry, how you doing? I want to be mad and can't be mad. And he helps me. He said, Pastor Barry, I, I know what you're here for. And he said, the, 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 all the flooring will be here in the morning, Thursday morning. That's the 14th. And I said, Gary, thank you. I wanted to be mad. But for me to preach sermons to you this morning, I, gotta, I get tested before I ever preach them. And thank God, my mouth shut and my ears were open and the Holy Spirit was working not to get mad. I got back out in my truck and I looked at heaven and I said, Lord, you sure are funny sometimes. <laughs> well, the next day, guess what happens? Next day, guess what? Stuff's good. My buddy Gary called me at 6 a.m. and said, Pastor Barry, the truck will be here around 8.30 to 10. And I said, well, that's good because all the people that are going to help me, they're old. They don't get up at 10 o'clock anyway. <laughs> and we had so much fun. And you need to see Steve Busman over here. He'll give you all the details of what happened on them. And so what will happen is everybody there showed mercy. Nobody lost their cool. Nobody showed out. What happened? But I just want you to know the real Barry. I struggle with it too. I struggle too. And he reminds me to show mercy. So when, when everybody in the store knows you, the pastor, and the stuff's not there, you better show mercy. So I begin to realize something. L.P. Myers is one of the phenomenal great theologians and writers said these words, when you see a brother or sister in sin, you have to realize that there are three things that you don't know. First, you don't know how hard he or she is trying not to sin, so don't judge them. Number two, you don't know the power of the forces that are sailing on him and her. So don't judge them. And then number three, you don't know what you would have done in the same circumstances. So don't judge them. Try a little mercy today. Show mercy by being kind and humble and gentle. Get along with other people that you don't even like. Forgive each other quickly. The better you understand God's mercy toward you, the more merciful you will be toward others. So let me remind you. If you were to read the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, chapter 7, and you were to read all of it, you would understand there's a wonderful story that Jesus, our model, does. He reminds us of the mercy that needs to be shown. Just imagine just for a moment that you could go back in a time machine and, and you were with Jesus and the disciples and the followers that were there at a party that was going on at a great Israeli leader named Simon. And the Bible says that he, Simon had invited Jesus and the followers. He's a Pharisee, by the way. He invites them to his home for a party. I like parties. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I like parties. And while they're in there, a lady comes in, 
And the Bible, if you study it from the Greek, and this is where you ought to study some of this stuff, and the Bible says, and she was a sinful person. Don't be misled by the term sinful to mean prostitute. So many writers do that. It just says sinful. It's got enough, that's enough. You don't need to put a character to it. And she comes in, and she takes her hair and wipes the feet of Jesus. This happens two times in scriptures for you that don't know this. It happens twice. And she pours perfume on his feet. And she stood behind him, behind his feet, weeping. And began to weep on his feet with tears. And then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume. And the Pharisees went nuts. He said, if you were a man, a prophet, a real prophet, you should know touching him and what the kind of act a woman did. She's a sinner. And Jesus answers, Simon, I have something to tell you. I like how Jesus changes the subject on this. Jesus goes on and tells him a story about two people that owe debts. And you know the story. Go home and read Luke 7 verse today. Around about verse 30. You'll discover that he's talking about this woman and he's talking about Simon judging her. She's immoral by his standards. Jesus wants to talk to Jesus. She wants to talk to Jesus. What would happen if a woman came into our church and did the same thing to me? Would it drive you nuts? It'd drive me nuts. But the point I'm trying to make is it felt uncomfortable. You know why? Because we're so comfortable in our churches that if someone came into our church who was not like us, it would upset us. May God fill our church with people that can upset us. He says that this woman was coming because she wanted to touch the feet of Jesus. For you and I, Jesus loved this person. And by the way, she would, we hope this is the woman we want to talk about. We won't name her name, but we hope that she's one who follows Jesus. And the people could not understand. And Simon began to change. Oh, by the way, did it embarrass Jesus that this woman did this? No. Why? It's because Jesus saw the big picture and he saw her heart. And he tells the story of two men who owed a debt. They were money lenders. And what happened? The, the person they owed the money showed mercy. One of them did. So by watching and doing, Simon has to remind himself that he cannot judge her. So let me share a story. I have some friends of mine that went to Hawaii. I think they went to see Hawaii 5 I don't know. I was mad because they didn't invite me. I wanted to see Hawaii 5 So in the story, I'll just use their names this way, the protected innocence. Harry and Jane. They go into a restaurant, and you know what this is like. There's no place to go where alcohol is not served anymore. You know that. And so if you want, let me just tell you where you preach. If you walk in and see me sitting at the bar, there's two reasons I'm sitting at the bar. One, I'm watching Sports Center. And number two, I'm trying to witness to the person in front of me. And number three, I get waved on faster. So Harry and Jane, they, they go into this place. It's a restaurant. And they're sitting at the bar, and there's a young lady comes in. The restaurant is full, by the way, and there's one seat beside Harry, and the woman's really, really not wanting to sit beside Harry. And finally, Harry says, oh, by the way, Harry and Jean, Jane are great Christian people. Harry says, come, come sit with me. Come over here. Come sit. And everybody's got her eyes on this woman, by the way. Jane picks up on that real quick, and Harry says, sit beside me. And he started talking to her. He said, would you, could I buy your lunch? She didn't know what to say. He told the lady behind the counter, give this lady what she would, fix her whatever she'd like, like to eat. And they sat there. 
The lady said, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. See, today's my birthday. He said, what? It's my birthday. He did not have to say one word to his wife about what she ought to do because the Holy Spirit was working. Miss Jane gets up and takes off. I don't know where they were in Hawaii. There's like 500 islands. I don't know which one they were on. All I know is she went out, came back, and she had a balloon and a gift. And she sits back down, and she hands the girl the balloon that says happy birthday, and she gave her a gift. I have no idea what the gift was. It doesn't matter to me. And the lady began to weep. And Harry did what Harry always done best. He just began to share what had happened to him and her, him and Jane, how Jesus changed her life, and how Jesus could change their life. The rest of the time on their trip, they went every day and they met her at that bar every single day. You see what happens, would our, would our church do that? Would we go and have a party for a lady or a person, a man, a female, who is not with the Lord? Would we be that kind of church? So let me tell you what a kind of church we have. If you're here this morning, I, I know I'm running a little bit. Don't leave. Don't nobody leave. Listen to me. Here at Calvin Cornerstone, this is the church we are. You're welcome here. If you're just browsing, if you just woke up, or if you just got out of jail. We welcome you if you've got all kind of ink on your arm and you got piercings or both. We offer you a special welcome to those who could use a prayer right now and had religion shoved down their throat as a kid and they got lost in the traffic and wound up making lots of mistakes. You're welcome here. We welcome all seekers and doubters. All people are welcome to Carolina Cornerstone. And if we don't have that attitude, may God have mercy on us. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, I just want to pray for every person in this room and those that are watching by live stream. As we read all this stuff, especially Luke 7, it's early in the ministry of Jesus and he teaches us how not to judge people and how to treat people so, God, in this prayer, I, I just want you to encourage the people that are within the sound of my voice. I know there's people in here who have questions, and they're confused because they've been taught wrong, Lord. They've been taught by people they believed in. But, Lord, I'm praying this morning that we would get the log out of our eyes so that we can see the world different. God, would you help me to see things true? Help me not to lose the opportunity to be a witness for you in my thought life, in my finances, in my recreation, and everything that I do, help me not to be a hypocrite. God, I don't know what you're telling our folks this morning. There are some folks in here that are struggling. Lord, I pray that right now you would open their hearts. God, let them take time to confess their sins to you by just simply saying, God, I am sorry. I've done this. I am so sorry. Forgive me. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. God, that you now, when I, you, when I ask you to forgive me and I ask you to come in my heart, you come into my heart and you make me a better person. And maybe someone in this room this morning, Lord, doesn't know you as personal Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray this morning, Lord, they would just simply ask you, Lord, come into my life. And God, give us the faith and, the, and help us today to be people that will trust you. I'm going to open this altar up. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus.